So hi, everybody. Um, I just would like to tell you this is my first ever lecture, so I hope you're patient with me. And um, it also turns out a few of my slides are missing, so this is going to be kind of a short lecture, and I hope you can forgive me for that, too. So I'll be discussing um, ancient sites and some of the symbols I found that were really interesting and I'll be skipping around a lot because I do have to travel quite far across the world to these sites and it takes a lot of time. And it might seem like I'm scatterbrained a bit. I am. But <laughs> just bear with me. <laughs> so um, I'll also be talking a little bit about my favorite culture, which is the Olmec culture. I love them. I hope you do too and will love them. <laughs> they're really fascinating and they're a megalithic culture. Uh, they need a whole nother lecture in themselves. Okay, first I'm gonna concentrate on the Boyne Valley area of Ireland and follow through with a site in the USA called Winnemucca Lake. Okay. And you guys all know what a symbol is. It's a marker character used as a representation of an object or process, okay? And symbology then is the study of symbols, right? And I refer to myself as a alternative symbologist. And my daughter, who is 17, was calling me a semiologist. I didn't know what that was. Okay, well it turns out semiology is the study of signs and symbols, right? But the smart aleck my daughter is, <laughs> semi means half or partly, ologist, a particular area of knowledge, an expert, so she was calling me half an expert. <laughs> so, uh, what can you do? <laughs> okay, so this is Newgrange, and uh, the age of Newgrange is about 5,200 years old. It's a passage tomb. Um, the mound itself is about 15 yards in height and 93 yards is the diameter. And around the site are about 97 curbstones and some of them have intricate carvings on them which you guys probably know already. Um, and it's said to have been built by Stone Age farmers. Okay, and I'm just gonna go through a few of the curbstones. I think this is curbstone 52. It's a nice one. And then here are some standing stones outside of it. And the famous triple spiral. Okay, and this site is Douth. And um, it's estimated to have been constructed between 2500 BC and 2000 BC. So it makes it about 4,500 years old. It is also a Neolithic passage tomb, and this site is also about 93 yards in diameter and 16.6 yards in height. It is also surrounded by decorated curbstones. Okay, some decorated curbstones, and this is sort of like a sun image stone. I, I like it, just wanted to show you guys that. Okay, so next is now. And it's also a Neolithic passage grave. And it has one major mound, which is this one. Uh, and it has about 18 minor mounds or satellite mounds uh, along the sides of it. Here's a close up, really close up image of the satellite mounds, a few of them. Okay. But the, the major mound, uh, the height is about 13.3 yards, and the diameter is about 73.3. Okay. And it's also surrounded by 127 curb stones, of which some are decorated. And here are a few that I really liked. Okay, and it, here's an image of the passage, the passage grave inside of it, too. Okay, the next site is Loft Crew, and it's located in County Meath, Ireland, also 
Again, another Neolithic passage grave. And the dating on this is about 3500 to 3300 BC. Um, this er, this uh, loft crew isn't just one small area. It's covered across three hilltops. And the, the, the names of these are Patrick's Town, Carn Barren West, and Carn Barren East. Uh, combined, these hilltops contain more than 30 mounds and cairns. Um, not sure exactly how many offhand, but the art located here is described as abstract symbolic carvings. Also, the carvings are associated with heavenly or astral symbols because of the orientation alignments of some of the monuments. Now, I'm particularly interested in Carn Baron East and uh, specifically Carn T, which is located inside of the image here. Okay, in this cairn, cairn T at the back, is a really special stone, and it's called the Equinox Stone. It's called this because on Equinox days, March 21 and September 21st, sunlight enters the tomb and illuminates the patterns on this stone, and this makes it significant. When I believe the ancients who made it wanted us to pay particular interest to, and so we should and I think we will begin to pay more attention to this. Now, um, all four of the sites I mentioned have a lot of similarities to each other, such as their alignments. For example, both Loft Cruz, Karen T, and New Grange have illumination in their passages. New Grange occurs on the winter solstice. And all of the four share similarities in regards to their carvings. And near <laughs> Karen T is a chair called the Hag's Chair. And this is me, so. And also on the Hag's Chair are some faded carvings which didn't show up in any of my pictures. So I pulled this off the internet, it's a old drawing. Okay. <laughs> Ireland has a huge amount of myths and legends relating to giants. Uh, a loft crew giant legend blamed the creation on it, on a giant witch whom was walking through the area one day on a chore. She was carrying stones in her apron, and when some fell out, they formed the site. I think that's a pretty cool story. I'm from America, we don't have it that often. Okay, so the next site, and one of my favorite sites, is called Winnemucca Lake Petroglyphs. Uh, a lot of you may not be familiar with it. It's, um, you, sh you should be, and I think you will be too soon. Um, this is a very difficult site to find. It's located in Nevada, in the USA. Mm. When I finally found this site after like a lot of driving and hiking, I was totally blown away when I got there. Um, it's, a, it's like a small site, but it is tremendous in measure. Um, also, I, I think I need to mention, too, that this site is located on a Paiute Indian reservation, and they protect it very thoroughly. So if you would like to visit it, you have to put in um, an application. I still know someone that is waiting after three years trying to get to see this site and they still haven't been approved. So, <laughs> yes, that's, that's how hard it is. Okay, um, back to why I was amazed and why it's so special. Because um, these carvings are the, known as the North America's oldest petroglyphs because they date to about 14,800 years old. That's astounding. The dating of the site was carried out by a team of researchers from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and they used only non-invasive techniques on the petroglyphs, of course, to prevent damage. A few different methods were used, including strontium isotope analysis and radiocarbon dating. Uh, However, we, we don't know the particular tools or way the carvings were created, but 
I can tell you a few things about them that are really amazing. These petroglyphs are much bigger in size and also deeper cut than any other petroglyphs in the USA. Um, they are grand. Uh, the stone is, a tu is tufa, which is a type of limestone. Okay, <laughs> there's some really interesting things. Also, the, fo the 14,800 year age of the carvings corresponds to the time near when the first migrations of humans occurred into North America. Another interesting thing about Winnemucca and Lake and the surrounding areas is that they were supposedly populated by red-haired, fair-skinned giants. Okay, there was a Native American Indian woman named Sarah Winnemucca, which I'll talk about in a moment. But these are the three little girls I took on tow with me to the site. So they were glad when we finally did find it. The one with her hand up above her eyes is the one that, the smart aleck that always makes comments to me. She did the halfway comment. But um, this is, there's an article that does the, that did the, shows the dating, the way it was dated, and um, it's the Journal of Archaeological Science. And I just, <laughs> here's the image of the red-haired giants. Or Hugh. <laughs> uh, this is Sarah Winnemucca. Okay, she was a member of the Paiute tribe. She published a book called Life Among the Paiutes, Their Wrongs and Claims in 1882. And this is a copy of that book cover. This was the first autobiography ever published by a Native American woman. She was the daughter of Chief Winnemucca, and so we know where the name of the area, the petroglyphs, come from now. The oral history of the giants, uh, or the tool eaters, or the sitika, was passed down through the Paiute tribe and still today, some still mention this in regards to the area of Winnemucca. The story is that these cannibalistic tool eaters, tool, by the way, is a fibrous water plant, but it no longer grows in the area. It's pretty much extinct there. Were pushed into the depths of a cave by the Paiute and other tribes that combined forces to defeat them. The tribes covered the entrance of the cave with brush piles, which they set on fire. The Sitika suffocated, and all that tried to escape were cut down. None survived. The next bit is from Sarah Winnemucca's memoirs. She wrote, my people say that the tribe we exterminated had reddish hair. I have some of their hair, which has been handed down from father to son. I have a dress which has been in our family a great many years, trimmed with reddish hair. I am going to wear it someday when I give a lecture. It is called a morning dress, and no one has such a dress but my family. I'd really like to see that dress. <laughs> but um, I can personally attest that the story of the red-haired giant still is being shared by some of the Paiutes because I had a very lovely encounter with a Paiute elder from the area after my visit at the Petroglyphs. I had so many questions, and so did my girls, about the site. I, I really wanted answers quick because I didn't realize that, how drastic and how big an impression that it would make upon me as, after visiting. I have, you, you have to go there. If you can, I, I really do advise it. So what we did, we decided to do, is we had passed by a small museum sort of near the area. I was intent on asking the museum worker questions. But when we started to walk in, I saw an elderly gentleman with his grandson there. And he was explaining things about the history of the Paiutes. I thought, how lucky am I? <laughs> so I sort of barged in and began to ask questions. And the gentleman had answers. He told me that the Winnemucca petroglyphs were not created by the Paiute, but by another people that were also there long ago. I thought this is strange, because usually, if there are carvings or something amazing like this, and they're on your land, 
you know, you might claim them or, you know, ancestors. So, but he says no. He also said that I should not take my young ones there and that before I visit them, I should prepare myself mentally and physically for the encounter with the spirits that dwell in that place. Too late. <laughs> but I asked him to tell me more about the other, these other people, and he did. He also said they were a race of barbaric cannibals that feasted on the dead. He said they were a very large and powerful people with strange red hair and light skin. They had fierce, large jaws like none that are seen today. And they knew how to draw magic. He said his ancestors cleansed them from the land and brought peace and balance back to the people. He said they did this because his people and others came together to battle these monstrous beings, and they forced them into a cave and burned them all to death. I asked him if he knew the name of this cave, because I wanted answers. And he said, all Paiute do. He said, today's people call it Lovelock Cave. I was really astounded because Lovelock Cave is famously associated with red-haired giants. There have been many stunning artifacts that have been excavated from the cave. I believe it's in the tens of thousands, actually. And there are a lot of accounts of giant mummies and red-haired mummies being found in the mix. They had a lot of fine textiles, uh, duck decoys, just a whole array of amazing items. Okay, so let's move on to some of the comparisons. It turns out that my images did not come out as high res as I would like. Uh, so please forgive that too. This is my favorite. Um, and you'll see why I think in a moment. This is me in front of the petroglyph. They are large, they are giant. And they are amazing. Now, um, this is me again up close because I wanted to sort of show you just with my head up close how big they are. And I don't know if you can really see the depth, but they are the deepest ones I've ever seen. And um, right now I'm going to start doing some comparisons between uh, mainly Loft Crew and the Winnemucca site, some symbols found there, but also in the Boyne Valley area, the area I described, okay. And, um, oh, I just, I, this side just amazes me. And this is a carving that's on the Equinox stone at Loft Crew, the, the image I showed you before in Cairn T. And so, this is the Winnemucca at the bottom, that really large one, and then one of the loft crew. And you can see that they are very similar. And this is just a, another version of that, just showing the placement at Winnemucca of the flower. And at loft crew, you can see the flower. So you know I'm not changing anything, right? Okay, and next is a zigzag pattern. Uh, the Winnemucca Lake ones are always large. And then the zigzag at the Cairn T. And over here, uh, I'm sure you can see it, is the zigzag at Winnemucca. And then right there at the top is the zigzag pattern on the Equinox Stone Cairn T. And then there's the simple uh, circle and dot on the Equinox Stone, and then circle and dot on the Winnemucca Petroglyph. And this one, um, I just sort of call it a mohawk. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's very similar. And the Winnemucca one is right here. And one of the ones on the Equinox Stone is at the top. 
right here. And the Winnemucca Lake uh, petroglyph here, I just call this a leaf, it could be whatever, but Winnemucca Lake, the Equinox Stone, and then another one at uh, Winnemucca Lake. Now you have to remember that these are all on small sites. The Equinox Stone is one small stone. The Winnemucca petroglyphs are on one large piece of tufa rock. It's broken into pieces now, but it was one piece. So it's interesting that the same symbols, even however simple, are all together on these two stones. Okay. And this is just showing one of the Winnemucca images. And this is me in front of, you, you'll see a lot of me in the images because I want you to see how large. That is just massive. Okay, and this one I just call rainbow. Uh, Karen T, the Equinox Stone, Nevada. And again, Karen T. And this one, I just call this bee pattern, like a bumblebee. Uh, Winnemucca Lake, and over here, Ireland. Now this one is at Newgrange, it's moved to the Boyne Valley area, but it's still in that area, the similar uh, region. And um, so you can see obviously right here, top and bottom. This is more complex, obviously. Uh, this is off of Curbstone 52, I think. Um, I think this one, somebody claims for this one to have uh, be showing Orion and Sirius star systems. I'm not sure about that. Uh, this is just showing Curbstone 52, the B image right there. And here at the Winnemucca is right here. Now, this is a serpent or wave pattern at Winnemucca. And this one is, I think, from Nauth, which is, again, the Boyne Valley area. And this is the full image of the Nauth one. My favorite one in now. Okay, and um, this is Winnemucca, and it has the cup, cupules, the cup marks. And this is the passage grave at uh, Loft Crew, and it has the cup marks. Now, this is, I think, my secret, second favorite. Uh, carving at Winnemucca Lake. Now it's um, the rhombus or diamond pattern, right? And then over here, of course, Curbstone 52 again with the same pattern. And this is me again, and behind me is that diamond rhombus pattern. It, is magnificent <laughs> sight. Okay, and um, I'm going to move on a little bit. This is at Paraguay, and um, Paraguay is interesting too because there is a rock face that has a lot of these same uh, symbols as well on one stone. I haven't been to Paraguay yet. I've been to Loft Crew. I've been to Newgrange, and I, I've been to all the sites of the Boyne Valley. But um, I'll just kind of show you a few. I, I'm not going to go too far into the Paraguay because I, you know, I want to check it out for myself. But there is the zigzag pattern, uh, or the M, I'm sorry, the sort of rounded M here. And 
these are just sort of like the zigzag, but it's kind of an M, not too worried about it. But over here, when a mukka, you have the sort of rounded M with the circle on the end here. It's interesting. And above, you see this actual bigger pictures of the stones. And here, um, Paraguay are what I called the Mohawk before here. And the one on the Equinox stone. And then again, here at Winnemucca. Okay. And then this, uh, some form of this, I think, the leaf pattern on all three of the stones. I wish I'd been there before. I, there would have been more images too, but. And this is just showing Paraguay again. And um, this site too is associated with giants, funnily enough. Um, and near that area supposedly is this giant footstep. <laughs> I haven't been there. I thought it was cool. And, um, you know, but lots of areas have stories of giants. Uh, Mexico does. Here's one that we, sort me and Hugh, encountered in Lebanon. It doesn't look that big from the image, but it, it was quite a big jawbone, and it was um, apparently belonged to a Phoenician. We, we found this in Lebanon at a museum there, and so I thought I would just throw that in because of the giants. And this, I think probably all of you have seen this image of Merlin and telling the giant where to put the lintel. I like this image because um, last year on the solstice, was it the solstice? Yeah, the solstice. I, I found this guy, right? He looks like the image. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was so happy. <laughs> I tried to explain to him, you know, what he looked like. I couldn't, and he didn't know, but he was happy to pose for me. <laughs> so now I'd like to skip over a little bit. And talk about uh, some of the bones, uh, skeletons, mummies that were found, only a couple of them near the Utah area, okay? And that would be Wizard's Beach Man, which I don't have an image of, but it's a Holocene skeleton that was discovered in 1978 at Wizard's Beach on Pyramid Lake. He lived about 9,200 years ago, according to radiocarbon dating, and he was discovered about 100 miles to the northeast of Spirit Cave Man, or Men, okay. Spirit Cave, which is right there. Here's Wizard's Beach Man. Right here are the Winnemucca petroglyphs. Um, Two people were found wrapped in tulle, tulle matting, which is that matting that uh, it's tulle. Do you remember I said that the Sitika uh, were tulle, tulle eaters? Okay, yeah, so that fibrous plant. So these skeletons were found wrapped in tulle mount, matting. Uh, like I said before, tool isn't found in that area anymore, not for a long time. So these skeletons are supposed to be really old. I'd see if I have a reconstruction of one of the spirit cave people. Let's see. Yeah, that's that one. And this is Lovelock Cave entrance. I just thought I would put that in there because that is where the story is, where they were supposedly um, destroyed, the last of the tool eaters, the Sitaka. Okay, and um, so here is Pyramid Lake. Interesting name, isn't it? 
And um, this is Winnemucca petroglyphs right here. It's not a far distance. You see that, that length is the kilometer, so it's pretty close. Now, Pyramid Lake shares some of its magnificence with the area. It's surrounded by Mars-like rock formations. Um, Pyramid Lake, like Winnemucca, has its fair share uh, tales of magic, ghosts, and giants associated with it. The lake is part of an ancient lake called Lahanatan that existed around 15,000 to 12,000 years ago, around the end of the last ice age. So that's, the Winnemucca Lake petroglyphs are dated to about 14,800 years. So about Lake Lahanatan, the ancient lake, would have existed during that time. Now, the Paiute tribe consider Pyramid Lake to be a sacred healing lake. Now, let's, let me show you why it's called Pyramid Lake. So this formation sits out on the lake. It's quite impressive. I like it. <laughs> and this, we all know, this is the Pyramid of Caffrey. So I'd just like to show you how close in resemblance it is. Caffre and then Pyramid Lake formation. It's pretty impressive. Now this is interesting. This is known as the Stone Mother. And, um, but first, I, I want to also mention that the pyramids at Giza, they have the stories about uh, subterranean chambers and tunnels that exist below them. Well, at Pyramid Lake, occasionally a corpse is found that the locals blame on a person having discovered the entrance to the tunnels that exist under that pyramid formation on the lake, and they became lost and drowned. I don't know how true that is, but that's just the story. So I want to read a passage to you. Uh, from a book called Sacred Places of North America. And it's about this formation here. This stone, the, the, the pyramid is in the same bay as the Stone Mother, so they're quite close to each other. The Stone Mother rock formation that relates to, the uh, relates to the Paiute creation myth. The story begins with the father of all Indians who had lived on a mountain near Pyramid Lake and married a good woman who bore him many children. The oldest boy was very mean and was sent to the west and another daughter with another daughter, while the nice children remained with their mother and became known as the Paiutes. The father returned to the mountain and then to the sky. But the mother grieved for her lost children and began crying bitterly every day. She sat on a mountain facing west and her tears began to form a great lake beneath her. This became Pyramid Lake. And since she sat for so long, she eventually turned to stone. There she remains to this day, sitting on the eastern shore facing west with her basket by her side. In pre-contact times, the northern Paiute Indians would paddle out to the bay and leave prayer offerings at the pyramid and by the Stone Mother. I thought that was a beautiful passage. So this is the Sphinx guarding the pyramid, Giza. And here's the Stone Mother guarding her pyramid. So, so I'll move on a little bit, um, since we're talking a bit about Egypt. This is a carving that I found at um, the Temple of Isis on the island of Philae. And I had seen a glimpse of this on the internet, and I didn't think it really existed. But I actually found it with Hugh <laughs> in the middle of the night. Uh, on the island when we were having an unauthorized visit. Yeah. There were no lights on, so all we had were lights from our phones and a few flashlights. 
But um, inside the serpent is the goddess, or the god Happy, which is uh, the god of inundation of the Nile. And he's sometimes attributed as a creator god. Um, Akhenaten actually accepted him as a form of the Aten because the sun would, whenever it set, it would look as though it was going into the Nile. Um, so this is why Akhenaten, even monotheistic, accepted this. But um, he sits inside this serpent. He's carrying happy, and the serpent has a bird's beak. It's interesting. It seems a lot of cultures around the world have the imagery associated with deities relating to the bird, the serpent, and the man, and feline, especially in South America, but it's all over the world. Now this image is found um, in Mexico. It's, uh, this particular one is at the Mexico City Museum of Anthropology, and it's an Ol Olmec artifact. And it was discovered at La Vinta uh, in Mexico. Now, you can see that this being here is being carried by a serpent and it has a bird's beak. And um, it's associated also with water because you see this being here has a fin on its back. And it, this, the being in the middle also has a helmet on that is a bird's beak, bird's head. So th this is really an interesting carving. I find a lot with the Olmec artifacts that they have layered imagery and you have to pay attention. Uh, to the detail. A lot of times I miss it, even if I'm looking for a very long time. The, the imagery they do is, is wonderful. Now, if I put them side by side, then you see the similarity between them. And these are artifacts that are across the world. They're just across the world from each other. But they have the same, same meaning, I think. And not only that, but um, the, uh, there were other people that also had the same serpent, uh, flying, carrying man imagery, and they had it, uh, the Phoenicians had it, and so did the Greeks. And it's probably just um, an, a form of one original deity or some, something in that, I don't have the answers, but somehow all around the world we keep finding the same imagery. Now oh, this is the most important thing I found. <laughs> Sorry to throw that in there. <laughs> Finally know the look that Michael Jackson was trying to achieve. An Egyptian woman from the New Kingdom period. <laughs> Okay, so now I'd like to, I have an article in the Ancient Origins online site, and it's about the Olmecs. And so I'm just going to sort of flip through, but I'm going to read from some of them that have the text. Makes it easier on me. <laughs> so the Olmecs were the first true Mesoamerican civilization. There were small villages and groups of people in the area which the Olmec developed but these societies are referred to as pre-Olmec. The Olmecs were a full-fledged civilization because they were more organized and socially advanced than their predecessors. And this is uh, the area here, mainly that the Olmecs were in, and it's the Gulf of Mexico area. Although they, they did spread out a bit further than that, we found some uh, proof of them in Guatemala, different areas. I think that the size of the Olmec area that is known today will eventually be expanded out further. But the most recognizable artifact created by the Olmecs are the 17 colossal basalt heads that have been discovered across four different sites. Okay. The Olmec, the Olmec culture was unique. Um, they're unique for many reasons. It seems like they developed alone without outside influences, but 
you know, they engaged obviously in activities such as trade, immigration. Um, developing independently is rare, and when this happens, the culture is known as pristine. Uh, the Olmec had several firsts in America as they developed the first monumental architecture and first signs of city planning. They were the first known people to use a writing system in the Americas, and another first with the use of chocolate, which was their preferred drink. Um, Olmec means rubber people. It's how the Aztec tribes describe the Olmecs, and to me this makes sense as they are the, really the best candidates for inventing the first ball games. Because um, in an area called Manitou, we've discovered uh, a pit of um, tar uh, that they, they've pulled out some rubber balls. The first rubber balls that, uh, that go with the ball game have been discovered ever, have been made by the Olmecs. So that kind of makes them a good candidate. And the Olmecs are the earliest known civilization in the Americas to have used mathematics and had the concept of zero. The first calendar in long count format was discovered in the Olmec region of Trezapotes on the lower half of Stela Sea. So um, what that means is the Mayans, the Aztecs, all of those uh, calendar systems, the Mayans have a three-part system, all of it developed originally from the Olmecs. They have it because of the Olmecs. Okay, okay, San Lorenzo, it was the first major city of the Olmec civilization, uh, population of at least 15,000, elaborate drainage system, which probably helped it be successful. The Olmecs achieved it, this feat by using carved stone pipes with lids. Um, it had a vast influence, political power. We think the colossal heads represented rulers or elites. Um, we don't know this for sure. There's, there's nothing telling us this. It's just a guess from what we you know, do today in our cultures. Um, each of the basalt heads differ from one another in facial characteristics and size. And they all have distinctive headdresses as well. Um, at San Lorenzo, the largest is 9.3 feet tall, uh, 6.9 feet wide, and weighs about 25.3 tons. Um, they were in alignment. The San Lorenzo heads were at the center of the site and formed two lines orientated, oriented north and south. Okay, and this is Monument One at San Lorenzo. It's big, and it has a headdress too. Each of them, like I said before, have intricate headdresses. They haven't really been studied or looked into much. I hope to do that on my next visits. And this is Monument One again, and there's Jim and author Jim Vieira. Co uh, he was co-author of his Giants book. And this kind of gives you a size perspective, but 25 tons, you know, it's pretty big. And this is Monument Two, and this one is located in the Mexico City Museum of Anthropology. And I have side views of this. And um, you can see here that it, also has layered imagery, and it has two birds, uh, sharp bird beaks forming into a uh, sort of snake uh, figure on the back. And uh, some people refer to these as helmets, hats, but the ball, when the ancient peoples would play the ball game, they would wear helmets, so. And this is the other side. And it's showing again the sort of bird serpent right there. You don't usually get to see the side images of the Olmec head, so I thought I would put what I have in here for you guys. Um, and this is the next monument. And this one is now located at the Jalapa Museum in Mexico. It's a wonderful museum if you ever can visit it. It has several of the Olmec heads in it, it's a treat. Um, and this one is also at the Jalapa Museum. I think this might be one of my favorite ones because its headdress is quite different, vertical and horizontal lines. Uh, this is also at the Jalapa Museum, but 
these are all from San Lorenzo site. They just now end up at the Jalapa Museum. This one's headdress is quite strange. I can't, can't quite figure it out. It might be related to um, some sort of sea creature because you know they lived along the Gulf Coast and I saw an image that sort of looked like that, but I can't say for certain. Interesting. And this is located, this Olmec head from San Lorenzo is now in the uh, Mexico City Museum of Anthropology. It's also a good museum if you can get to it. And it has a sort of crosshatch pattern. And this pattern goes all the way around it. This is a nice, nice one. And here's a side view of it. And a lot of them have these I'm not sure what these are, if they're going through the ear. Some of the, I don't know what you call them, spikes that people wear today, and they did in some of the Amazon tribes. But yeah, side view. And this is also from San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo had 10 heads at that side, just if I didn't mention that. This one is kind of modeled up. It's a little bit damaged, still nice. And this one is known as the pretty one because it was really carefully buried and it's a light color. It's really beautiful. There's not much damage. It's a nice one. So I don't like this. <laughs> this one. This one freaks me out in person. I don't know how, but when you walk across it sort of follows you. I don't know why. It's just creepy, but I have to show you because it's part of the San Lorenzo collection. Again, at the Jalapa Museum. Here's me in front of it, trying to face my fears. But it's showing you again the size. And this is uh, from San Lorenzo, and it's actually located at the San Lorenzo uh, city, which is sometimes rare to get the Olmec heads where they actually came from. But um, Hugh and I went here, and it's kind of a bit of a hard place to find, but we managed it. And I don't have um, all of the images of the artifacts from this site, but I will have them up on my uh, Facebook author page if you want to peruse it at some point. They will eventually be up there. A lot of them are quite strange. And this is a side view. Now these little things here were at the San Lorenzo site. They were in a, a big container. I think over 40,000 of these were found. They're just about an inch in size, uh, width, and length. Now, it turns out that these are called, they're made out of a mir uh, mineral called eliminite, and eliminite has magnetic properties, which is interesting. We know that the Olmecs knew about uh, magnetism because they had one of the earliest forms of the compass used in uh, central Mexico. So I was looking at the Olmec head and then these little pieces, and I thought, you know, I think that helmet, it was made out of these, you know, aluminite, like I guess the first magneto or something. <laughs> but, but it's interesting. The things you find are amazing at these sites. Now, this is Monument One. It's located at... Uh, La Venta Park. And uh, La Venta came into prominence around 900 BC. It had thousands of inhabitants and was about 200 hectares. Um, and this, the power base was much further. But they had farming, fishing, moving stone blocks from quarries. They did trade. Uh, they had a priesthood, a ruling class. Uh, La Venta was built on top of a ridge along the Palma River. Um, now, the Olmecs built pyramids, okay? They were pyramid builders. 
Um, the, there were four colossal heads found here, and three of the four were oriented in a line east to west. So that's, that's really interesting that they lined up these monuments. Um, this is Monument 2. Uh, it's located at the Carlos Pelliker Museum in Villa Hermosa, um, but it was found at La Vinta. And this is a size comparison of it. It's, this one is smiling and it has its teeth showing, so I guess it was a happy deity or ruler, or whoever it was. <laughs> it's cute. And this one is Monument Three, and it's known as the Young Warrior, and it's located at uh, Villa Hermosa at the Levinta Park. Levinta Park um, is an outdoor area with a lot of Olmec figures. They have some replicas, but they have a lot of original stuff too, and it's combined with a sort of zoo area. Um, I know they used to have a jaguar there, a black one, because the Olmecs they were fascinated by the, by the jaguars, but I hope since the last time I was there that they sort of let that, you know, somewhere else because it was sad <laughs> to walk by it. And this is Monument Four, and it's known as the Old Warrior. And you can see it has sustained some damage and it's just sort of wonky looking anyway. Now this is Tres Zapotes. <laughs> This is an interesting one. It's Monument A, and it's quite big, but you see how its eyebrows are furrowed and its eyes are just staring. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a big one. Now, this is where some of my slides got mixed up, so I'll try to fix it. I mentioned that at La Vinta there was a pyramid. This is the pyramid. Um, yeah, this, I, I think it was earlier, but this is stating that the building of the pyramid began around 1200 BC. I think it was more around 1400 BC. Okay. So um, it was 100 feet, uh, 10 feet tall and 100,000 cubic meters with earth fill. Uh, this is a side view of the Olmec head at Tres Zapotes. Uh, just saying a little bit about Tres Zapotes, but we'll move on to another of the images. And this is the back of that Olmec head. It's got sort of hair hanging down. And this is another one from Tres Zapotes, uh, although it's not located there. And here is Hugh trying to be an Olmec. This is a good, good try. <laughs> In the back of this Olmec head has uh, braids, that's kind of interesting. The only one that has like this. And La Cabada was the largest Olmec head and it has its eyes shut, the only one too. It's the biggest and so it might have been the last one, the offering from the quarry. And this is a unfinished Olmec head. They don't count it really. And this is uh, what may be an Olmec head or a later stage of an Olmec head at Cholula. We think Cholula may have been uh, first started by the Olmecs. It's the largest pyramid in Central uh, America, maybe even the world, I think. Is that right? Yeah. And this is a side view reconstructed at the site, and it has tunnels inside of it. And this is talking about Olmec religion. Uh, they were sort of sh shamans and they were obsessed with jaguars and switching into them. Uh, and the Olmecs were megalith builders, like I mentioned before, and here's one of their really large monuments. And this, this artifact is interesting to me. Uh, not much is known about it. We, Hugh thinks it has acoustic pro uh, properties. But here's me standing in front of it to give you a side view, or a size view. And this I found in a book, and this artifact is interesting. And the only other image of it I could find was in black and white. And on top of its head is a image that looks a lot like that uh, large acoustic artifact I just showed you. So you put them side by side, it looks similar. Uh, I put this one black and white just to show you. 
Now, we don't know what it is. Not much research has been done, but you know, I'm still trying. And these uh, have intrigued me. These are held by the Olmec okay, in the hands, in a lot of the artifacts. And that one comes off of this artifact from San Lorenzo. And here's another one at the Jalapa Museum. And they look like shin rings that are held by royal elites. This one is the Queen of the Night from Babylonia, about 1800 BC. This is the full image. This uh, deity is holding a shin ring as well. Let's skip. Some of these are confused. Okay, well, this is Altar 4 located at Leventa, and I was looking at it, that, and I was thinking, well, this is interesting. It's showing the entrance of the cave, the beginning of life. Here's a close of it. And if I turn it sideways, yeah, it looks a bit similar to what those Olmecs were holding in their hands. So I did a little bit of drawing on it. Just look at this image again. And then I sort of put them side by side. And the Olmecs, in this image, the Olmec is holding its hands, and you see here, he's grasping too. So I just, I think that some of the things are so obvious, yet not. They're right in front of us, and we just sort of have to pay attention. So I don't have much time left. Sorry, I'm trying to hurry a bit. These, were, these are located in the Jalapa Museum. They were found at the El Azizul site. Uh, this is me and Hugh with the owner of the El Azul site. Now, there's a people called the Ainu people from Japan. They are the indigenous population of Japan before the Asian people that we know of today got there. They look Caucasian. A lot of them had blue eyes. Now, if I put this image here beside the, uh, uh, the Olmec culture itself has a lot of Asian influence. Now, I'm trying to show that eventually. And there's a lot of images I don't have here because it would just take forever. Um, but the headdress here, you can see, is very similar. And here's just another image of the one, but this one has a little bit more sort of rounder thing. Even some of their this symbolism they still use today on their clothes is the same as the Olmec patterns and stuff that I found. I think this is really interesting. We need to study symbols in detail because they can show us a lot more than just uh, migration patterns or bones or something, you know, like that. I think a lot of you might recognize this. I'm sort of going scattered here. Uh, but this is the Royal Coat of Arms of England. And this is a cylinder sill from uh, Assyria. It's about from 1250 to 1200 BC. You see the lion? This. The only difference here is this is a pegasus. That's a unicorn. Some things don't change. That's uh, the royal one of the elite royal symbols, and again today, so. The bloodline is still there, they still use it. Um, so this is just, just after this is just images from across the world showing the same symbolism. Um, here is Egypt with the Uraeus wings. Here is a Ahura Mazda. Um, here you can see the winged sun disk. This is a uh, King Hezekiah of Jerusalem from 700 BC, the circle and the wings. And um, this is from Teotihuacan in Mexico. And you see the circle with the wings. Um, so I think there's something there. We just need to look into this field of symbol research a little bit more. Um, this is from the Ojibwa people. Uh, in the, they're in Canada and then the upper north, uh, upper USA. Um, and this is Egypt, of course. And if you take these images over here, you'll see some similarities. You'll see the Jed pillar here and similar, the same amount of bars and sort of the hands going up the, the circle. The, these are just um, 
small, I was actually up in Canada for a month studying the Ojibwa people. Um, I got to go to a lot of sites because they are intriguing. They have so many symbols that are exactly the same as the ancient Egyptians. And they, act, they even say, we come from across the sea, our Ojibwe ancestors. It's interesting. And this is the uh, Shamash tablet. This is a Shamash symbol. Uh, this is one of the, uh, this is from the Crow tribe in the USA. You'll see that, of course, it's the same symbol here. Interesting. Now this is a Mississippian culture head, and you'll see it the, on the forehead here. Interesting symbol, we just saw it. And over here is the exact same, uh, in every way, exact same to the image I just showed you before, except on its head, it has a, a cross pattern instead. Now, if we combine these two together, we get this, the Shamash symbol. And th these people say that their ancestors came again from across the sea. So it's, it's quite interesting. There, there are, I think I'm out of time. Okay. Uh, there, again, on the Shamash tablet, we have the symbols here, right here, and they are the same symbols that are found um, on this site here in the Yucatan Peninsula, right here. And this is interesting. Um, this is a pre-Columbian monolithic axe here. And this is one from Spiral Mounds. I visited this site lots of times. And um, this is another pre-Columbian from the USA. This is from France at a site called Loch Mariacure. It's an axe carving that's on the ceiling. And you can see the similarities, right? The design of it, the hook at the top and at the bottom as well. These are, these are really interesting. The France one is dated to 4500 BC. Um, this is talking about the seven-headed imagery or the seven chakras. We find this in, uh, of importance in cultures across the world. This is India, Mexico, Siberia. This one's 5,000 years old. Some people say it looks like a menorah. And this one, too, is from Mexico. And this one is from Samaria. And it has six heads up here and seven here that's been defeated already. And I'll just do this really quickly. This is the M on a stem symbol right here. Yeah? And it represents the eternal line in Egyptian hieroglyphs or the family lineage. And this symbol up here in Egypt too, you can see a woman giving birth here, and she has behind her this eternal line symbol and this circle. Well, over here at Easter Island, on the back of the Moai, is the M on the stem with circles. And this is another Mo Moai over here. And there is an M on, I, had this done so you can see it clear. An M on a stem and the circle. And from this, uh, the La Talita culture, a lot of their artifacts show the M with the circle. The placement is a little bit different, but in many of the artifacts, they are the same. I just had this slide previously made. Now this is uh, from Tula, Mexico, and these are known as butterfly warriors. And note the headdress. This is uh, Marduk from ancient Mesopotamia. And um, this is a recreation of an image from Babylonia, I think. But note the headdresses. They are so similar. And there are a lot of similar imagery from this site, Tula, with these other cultures as well. And I think. I, since I had lost some slides, this is sort of the end of it, but I want to show you how large these butterfly statues are. Here is me and Huge standing next to them. They're 
quite cool if you can get there. So, so that's, I guess, the end of it, and I um, hope you liked it, and thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.